Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, everyone, and welcome. I'm Ann Gauthier. Um, I am the project leader for the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, which we call the LAN for short. The LAN project is led by the CMS Alliance to Modernize Healthcare, known as CAMH, operated by the MITRE Corporation on behalf of CMS. I'm delighted to be with you today for this important discussion on partnering with patients to develop patient-centered health systems and patient-centered payment models. So on this slide, um, you see the session objectives. Um, everyone who is participating today wants to build a patient-centered health system, and we know the path to get there is not as straightforward as one might think. We have with us today a panel of representatives from several consumer and patient organizations who are involved in payment reform with a goal of ensuring the patient perspective is integrated into the design and implementation of APMs. We'll say APMs, alternative payment models. Today you're going to get some ideas on how to create a culture of patient engagement, what is and is not meaningful engagement, and lessons on engaging patients from cancer care payment reform. As you can see from this slide, which presents the agenda, we have a very full agenda for this 75-minute session. During the first 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar, Dr. Mark Smith, who is co-chair of the Land Guiding Committee, will provide an update from the Guiding Committee. We'll have a few minutes after his report if you have any questions for him. Following that, at about the 12.15 mark, comes the learning portion of the webinar, which will feature our moderator, um, who is also a guiding committee member, and a panel of three presenters sharing their perspectives on approaches to building a patient-centered health system and ensuring that payment reforms re reflect the patient perspective and are good for patients. We will look forward to your questions for our panelists. Um, which will come at the end, but you can actually submit them during the, in the chat window at any point during the webinar, and we will be uh, collecting and sorting them and, and turning them to Alan uh, for moderating the question portion. So with no further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce Mark Smith. I've already told you he is um, one of our guiding committee co-chairs. He is also the visiting professor, uh, he is a visiting professor at the University of California at Berkeley and clinical professor of medicine at the University of California at San Francisco. Um, as I noted, he'll give you the update on the guiding committee and then we'll be able to take your questions. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Ann. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, a lot has happened since our last guiding committee report out. We're fast approaching the uh, the one year mark of the land, which was launched last March when the secretary announced HHS goals of tying at least 30% of Medicare payments to quality and value through alternative payments or APM models by 2016 and at least 50% by 2018. The land hopes to help extend these goals to the private sector and to state payers as well and is focused on not only changing uh, health care payment, but identifying what's needed for an APM to succeed. As a public-private effort involving diverse stakeholders across healthcare, to date over 1,400 individuals and organizations are participating in the LAN. Uh, let me say a little bit about how we're organized. Uh, we now have four work groups um, that report to the guiding committee, which sets the strategy for achieving LAN's goals. The work groups are moving clockwise, uh, starting the APM Framework and Progress Tracking Group, uh, the Clinical Episode Payment Work Group, the Population-Based Payment Work Group, and the very new Payer Collaborative. Uh, the Guiding Committee and Work Group members are selected to represent diverse stakeholder groups, including providers, health plans, purchasers, employers, consumers and patient advocates, and state, regional, and federal uh, perspectives. We also have three affinity groups listed here, the Purchaser Affinity Group, Consumer and Patient Affinity Group, and State Engagement Group that provide bi-directional engagement with particular stakeholder groups for the work of the guiding committee uh, and of the various work groups. Um, so um, 
The APM uh, Framework Tracking group, Work Group established last fall just reached an important milestone in its work uh, with the release of the APM Framework White Paper on January 12th. Uh, the framework tries to articulate key principles and give some guidance to help healthcare providers identify where their existing and planned payment models fit within the broad range of categories of APMs. And you can access this white paper on the LAN website. In addition, uh, we published a blog last week uh, written by Sam Nussbaum, Mark McClellan, Patrick Conway, and myself that talks about this issue. So those of you who read or follow health affairs may be interested in that as well. Um, the APM uh, work group is now taking a pause, and we've recently kicked off the next step in our goal of making and measuring progress in moving towards person-centered care. The new payer collaborative is developing an approach to understand where we are as a nation in terms of APM adoption. And you see here the vision and the charge of the, the newly formed payer collaborative. I'll give you a second to look those over. Uh, so let's talk about the, uh, the other work groups that are now at work. Uh, the population-based payment and clinical episode payment work groups are well on their way to releasing their own draft white papers. As you can see, uh, we've been trying to move very quickly. We'll be conducting a virtual presentation of the draft patient attribution and financial benchmarking white papers on February 9th. Um, let me just say a little bit about what that means. In, time, in terms of trying to define and measure payments to a group of people, a population-based payment, the question is how does a patient get into that group? Do they know? Do they have to agree? On what basis uh, is their attribution decided? The financial benchmarking, if payments are made relative to some benchmark of what payments would or should have been without the intervention of a new model, how do you do that benchmark? How do you update it over time? Um, performance measurement and data sharing are the other two so-called sprints uh, that we've developed to kind of dig down into the nitty-gritty details of how to harmonize payment across different payers to different providers in a population-based model. As for clinical episodes, the CEP work group will open its comment period and present its draft paper on elective joint replacement bundles on February 17th. You see that's the first sprint that, sprint that they have launched. And future sprints that are planned are for maternity care, labor and delivery, and for cardiac care. Both of these work groups are working on additional sprints, as indicated here. You can find out more information about these groups on our website, uh, which you should know is https colon slash slash hcp-land.org. So, um, talk a little bit about communications. When you visit the website, please make sure to subscribe to the newsletter so that you can receive updates on the progress of the work groups via our now semi-monthly newsletter. We also urge you to get involved in LAN-affiliated communities in the LAN, co the LAN collaboration portal which is called Handshake. And again, all this is laid out uh, on the website. There are online affiliated communities for each work group, which is how work groups solicit input and provide feedback on questions and ideas to help shape their thinking. Land participants are using Handshake increasingly to engage in these and other discussions on payment reform, to ask for advice on payment models, and make connections with other land participants. And you can request a Handshake account by e emailing paymentnetwork at mitre.org. Um, let me point out uh, an upcoming event which we hope will be of interest to many of you on the call today. Uh, our next in-person meeting is the next LAN Summit, which is set for April 25th and 26th in Virginia, Tyson's Corner. At the October 2015 summit a couple of months ago, 450 people attended that one-day event to learn about APM models that are succeeding and to meet other innovators. The spring summit will be an expanded meeting with two days of learning and connecting, and we hope to have room for up to 800 people to attend. 
So please stay tuned for the call for abstracts and the registration portal, which will be opening soon. And we'll look forward to having you with us at that in-person meeting April 25th and 26th in Tyson's Corner. So um, this is the time for a few questions. Um, do you have questions about the things I've just reported on, on other aspects of the guiding committee's work? Um, you can use the chat window on the left part of your webinar dashboard, uh, and we'll give you a few minutes to see if anybody has questions. I don't see any. In that case, going once, going twice. If you do have questions, uh, even as the panel is going on, please remember you can enter them in the chat window on the left side of the webinar portal. And if we have time later, we can certainly try to get back to them. Uh, it's now time to move on to our panel discussion on the topic of working with patients as partners in designing and implementing APMs. With us today is Alan Balch, a member of the Land Guiding Committee and CEO of the Patient Advocate Foundation, who will serve as the moderator for our panel. So with that, Alan, take it away. The floor is yours. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we have a great panel for you today, and I think we're going to have a great discussion on this important topic. I'm going to introduce each of them at the start of their presentations. You can go ahead using the chat feature uh, queue up your questions as they're presenting. We will hold questions, though, until uh, the end of the panelists' presentations, each of whom will have about 10 minutes to present, and then we'll have a dedicated uh, question and answer period at the end. So please, uh, you know, at any time, enter your questions, and we will uh, go through those when we get to the Q&A. Uh, our first panelist is Sarah Von Gertruden, who directs the Partnership to Improve Patient Care, or as we affectionately know them as TIPSI. Uh, she will share ideas for creating a culture of patient engagement. Uh, Sarah? Thank you, Alan. I appreciate, appreciate you. Um, so the Partnership to Improve Patient Care is a, is a coalition of organizations. Um, we were created to basically bring principles of patient centeredness to this discussion. Um, and I'm, for some reason, having trouble advancing. Oh, never mind. I was having trouble advancing. Um, we were founded in 2008. Uh, we began as a coalition focused on patient-centeredness and research and strongly advocating for the creation of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And what was really special about PCORI is that in being patient-centered, Congress created um, some special provisions that would allow for patients to be part of the Board of Governors, uh, for, uh, for the organization's research and agenda to be driven by patient input and questions that matter to patients. Um, so we were really pleased that Congress recognized um, that there is a patient-centered way to do research. And so now that we have evolved a bit, um, you know, we've, we've recognized that as we see PCORI actually advancing some very patient-centered strategies for research and changing the culture, um, that a lot of those lessons learned could also be applied elsewhere, or elsewhere in our healthcare system. And it's going to be extraordinarily important for us to do that so that we're connecting the dots between that patient-centered research that is typically looking at outcomes that matter to patients and then translating that into effective uh, patient decision aids and shared decision-making um, tools that effectively gives patients uh, a good idea of what their healthcare options are and how those <coughs> options impact their own um, their impact their own lives. Um, you know, not just from a from a survival aspect or whatever. You know, some of the clinical outcomes that we are, are often think of, but some of the quality of life outcomes that um, sometimes are not captured in the research. So we've grown to 53 advocacy groups. Um, we've engaged many others in our roundtables, which is uh, where the information that I'll be sharing comes from. Um, and, you know, we really have tried to earn the reputation as the authentic voice of patients. Um, some of you may be familiar with Tony Quello, our chairman, who is an epilepsy patient himself um, and a very strong advocate on behalf of people with disabilities. <clears throat> so in terms of, you know, when I talk about the culture of, of patient engagement, we, we look now at, at PCORI as, a, as, as one of the models that are out there. 
But I think it's going to be very important to translate that culture over to, the, to, the, uh, to this discussion about alternative payment models. So when we talk about uh, creating a culture of patient engagement in this context, we're talking about formalizing avenues to provide a meaningful voice to patients in research and the creation and testing of alternative payment models, ensuring value and quality definitions that are driven by value to patients, fostering informed choices from the range of clinical care options through shared decision making, and by empowering patients with accessible, understandable evidence to achieve their personal treatment goals, and avoiding a singular focus on cost containment and protecting against a one-size-fits-all approach to patient care. Something that Chairman Quello often says um, is that no patient is average. Um, and for a lot of folks who particularly have chronic conditions, they'll often say that what works, you know, what may be best for one patient is not necessarily best for all patients. And so we caution against those um, sort of average assessment tools that look at value. And then, of course, supporting access to new medical advances is a, is a key component. So what does it mean to achieve outcomes that matter to patients? And you know, what we have learned is that the term value is often sort of a loaded term. And what we really should be advancing are outcomes that matter to patients, because that's ultimately our goal. And so those considerations include things like the range of endpoint care outcomes and treatment goals that matter to patients, factors that influence differences in value to patients within populations, the differences in perspectives and priorities between patients, caregivers, people with disabilities, consumers, and beneficiaries, and how patients want to be engaged in their health care and treatment decisions and characteristics of meaningful shared decision making to support this. Um, this issue, I think, came up in one of our recent calls with the consumer and patient affinity group that you know, one of the tests of whether we're really achieving a patient-centered health system is our ability to meet patients where they are. Um, patient engagement also should be happening at the policy development level. There are many tiers to patient engagement, and it's not only you know, having patients well engaged in the care that they receive at the doctor's office, but it's also having patients engaged in the front end of, of developing policy and making sure that there are pathways for their voices to be heard. And so what is the challenge? The challenge is providing value and value to whom. And so we, you know, we would argue that it should be considered value to the patient. Value to the patient should be reflected in alternative payment models with policies that support patients to be active and informed participants in their own care. Shared decision-making tools should inform patients and caregivers on all of their treatment options as well as the impact based on patient needs, preferences, and outcomes. And this is where the work of PCORI can be very relevant because hopefully that kind of patient-centered outcomes research is feeding into these types of tools. And of course, there is no one algorithm for value, something that you will, again, often hear Tony Quello, our chairman, say. And so in terms of our recommendations, um, FIPSI has really, we, we've convened a lot of roundtables, discussions. Um, we often bring our patient organization members together to try to glean from them what is it that we could do to establish these pathways for patients to be more engaged, not just in the care to care level, but at the policy level? So one of the things that we have come up with, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail on the next slide, is the idea of creating a national advisory panel on patient-centeredness to give patients a voice in emerging alternative payment models. And certainly we need to identify and subsequently apply clear patient-centeredness criteria in the approval and evaluation of alternative payment models. Interestingly, Congress does actually recommend that CMS apply patient-centeredness criteria, but um, we're still, I think, we, you know, we, that is still something that, although we all use the term patient-centered, um, and that's, a, I think, a very great step in the right direction, you know, it, it is time now, I think, to put some meat behind the bones of that terminology to make sure that um, that, that it has meaning and that we all know exactly what it does mean. Including patients and providers in the development of quality improvement and measurement. Develop tools to translate evidence to practice with patients. Oftentimes you see shared decision-making tools that are really geared toward the clinician and I think one of the gaps that 
that we have recognized and have been have been told by our patient um, patient members is that there are there's a need for more decision making tools that interface with the patient themselves. Use value definitions centered on outcomes that matter to patients. Prioritize alternative payment models that engage patients and use what we would call real shared decision making, which means that you have access to information on all of your treatment options, their impacts on the outcomes that you care about, out-of-pocket costs, et cetera. And then, of course, allow providers the flexibility to tailor care to an individual patient. So one of the things that we've, we've recognized is that, you know, of late, there is more focus on reimbursement for things like care planning. Um, we are talking a lot about shared decision making. But to connect the dots, we really need to make sure that patient preferences are being captured in care planning and that shared decision making is being used to achieve the goals that are identified by the patient in that process so that we're measuring quality based on achieving patient preferences and goals. And just to give a little bit more flavor on uh, the patient advisory panel idea, this is something that actually has emanated from a couple of the roundtables that we have convened over the last year. And it is something that we've identified as a potential pathway for patients to be engaged at the front end um, in the context of alternative payment models. But the idea would be to have a patient advisory panel that advises CMMI in particular, and, uh, and could be others, um, as they relate to the development, implementation, and evaluation of APM. And some of the key areas that would benefit from patient input. You know, it's going to be very important for patients to, to be able to help identify those areas where their input is most valuable, considering a number of patient-centered factors, such as process for monitoring and updating patient care plans, preferences and choices of applicable individuals, and whether models place the applicable individual at the center of the care team. And then to assist with the evaluation of APMs, hopefully based on the development of some clear and concise patient-centeredness criteria. Um, as some of you may know, there was funding provided in the recently passed MACRA bill for measure development and endorsement. Um, and so what we've been advocating is that that's really focused on outcomes that matter to the individual patient. And that's another place where a patient advisory panel could potentially be providing input. You know, we, we often, I often learn from patients that even when we're talking about things like patient-reported outcome measures, oftentimes what you hear is that the measure was developed outside of the patient, that patients weren't involved in their development, they may not have been at the table. And so I think one of the things that we'd like to highlight is that there's a need for patients to be at the table from the get-go in the development stage. And then, of course, developing and applying the required uh, patient-centeredness criteria to APM. Um, so I think if we can get to the point where we have some clear meaning behind what it means to be patient-centered, it's going to help tremendously as we move forward with the development of APM so that we know that we're achieving what, what, what is important to patients and the outcomes that really matter to patients. And it would provide a really structured patient-focused framework that would guide CMMI's work and hopefully the work that we're doing within the Healthcare Payment and Learning Action Network. And of course, one of those key components would be making sure that we're not denying or limiting coverage of benefits for Medicare beneficiaries. And so just to wrap up, I think you know, the take home message for PIPSI is that patients and patient groups should be engaged in the development, implementation, and evaluation of APM based on criteria for patient-centeredness developed by patients and not surrogate voices. It is wonderful that we're having this conversation and that it's wonderful that so many stakeholders are engaged and at the table because we all want to know what it means to be patient-centered. But if we really want to know what it means to be patient-centered, that information should be coming directly from patients. And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate and thank you, Alan, for your leadership. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, so again, keep the questions coming uh, through the chat feature, and we'll get to those in the Q&A section. So now let's hear from Lauren, Mo Lauren Murray, who directs consumer engagement and community outreach for the Partnership for Women and Family Families. She will talk about meaningful engagement and learning from the Comprehensive Primary Care Coalition. Uh, take it away, Laura. Lauren, sorry.
Lauren, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Pardon me. Um, I'm actually trying to advance my slides and they're not uh, advancing. So um, Brian, perhaps you could help me um, and move to um, the next slide. Great, thanks. Uh, so just quickly, the National Partnership has been around for uh, about 45 years. Um, we're a nonprofit uh, consumer advocacy organization um, working uh, to fight for access to affordable, high-quality health care, uh, among a variety of other issues. Um, our extensive health care portfolio includes working on new models of payment and care delivery, consumer engagement, quality measurement, and health information technology, as well as uh, what's not listed here, improving the quality of maternity care. And we also lead several coalitions that advocate for meaningful changes in healthcare delivery. Um, and I help to uh, lead a team that works on translating policy to practice, uh, so making sure that all those um, great policies, rules, and regulations actually meet their goals um, when we start to um, use them on the ground. Next slide, please. So the point of me showing you this slide, um, while the content is important in terms of um, helping you understand a bit more about what patients and families have told us they want from the healthcare system, um, the real point is that uh, many years ago when the patient center medical home model um, was starting to become more um, well-known and widespread and there was lots of buzz about it, we had several consumer organizations coming to us and asking if, they, if we had heard about this model and what we were doing to oppose it. So they were asking us, should we be organizing some sort of large-scale opposition effort? Um, because to, to many of these organizations and to the people that they represented, um, the patient-centered medical home felt too much like um, the old managed care model that just didn't work for patients and families. And so we were really, um, the point is that we need to ask uh, the right people the right questions. And so when we went out and we talked to patients and families about um, what patient-centered care means to them, these themes developed. Next slide, please. And so what this really boils down to is the fact that um, patients and families, as well as clinicians and staff, we all want the same things. We just might use uh, some different terminology. Um, we care about the job satisfaction and quality of life for clinicians. We want to have a relationship with you and care about you as a human being. We care about getting better and about waste and inefficiency. Um, and we just want to be involved in all the ways that uh, Sarah mentioned earlier um, when it comes to building or um, redesigning our healthcare system. Next slide, please. So we talk a lot about what patient engagement is, and I wanted to go over just a couple of things. I'm going to fly through some of these slides so I can get to some examples. Um, we talk a lot about what patient engagement is, um, but we need to talk a bit about what it's not. And so you see the things listed here. Um, the, the, what this boils down to is that this isn't about doing things to and for patients. It's about creating a system with them. Um, we, we learned with um, uh, managed care in the 90s that um, if we built the system and we thought it would work, that patients and families would come and that it would work for them, and it didn't. And so we don't want to repeat that. Next slide, please. And so here's a redefined um, version of patient engagement. Um, and you'll see that there's the source is an article which uh, presents a framework for patient and family engagement um, that covers a lot of the uh, principles that Sarah talked about. Um, as well as many other consumer organizations. And it's that patients, families, the representatives, and health professionals are working together in active partnership at various levels across the healthcare system to improve health and health care. So it's about how we're getting patients and families to tell us what they need the system to do. And so we have to figure out um, redefining the ways that we engage with them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So patient and family engagement needs to happen at multiple levels within the healthcare system. It's, um, the first one is the one that most people are familiar with, uh, patient empowerment, um, engagement at the point of care, 
Um, we also need engagement in, in system redesign or care process redesign. So how are care coordination and transitions and care processes working? Um, how can we improve the patient experience? We need engagement at the governance level, level setting policy for initiatives or organizations. So that's participating on a board of directors, helping to set job descriptions, um, perhaps it's setting national qualification criteria or payment policies for medical home initiatives or, or other new initiatives. And it's also engaging across the community. So how can the system work with and across community groups to redesign care? Um, and that could be advising on community resources and facilitating connections to those community supports, um, serving on these broader governing or advisory boards, and, and a variety of other roles. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And this slide, um, while it's small, probably on your screens, um, it's an excerpt from the article I mentioned earlier. And it's just a visual representation of the framework that I just described. And what you'll see is that there are a variety of levels of engagement, the direct level of care, system redesign, and policy making. And then there's a continuum. So on the low end of things, you have um, patients uh, are involved, but they have limited power or decision-making authority, and it's the provider organizations and the systems that define their own agendas and then seek patients' input, whereas at the higher end, engagement is characterized by shared power and responsibility with patients and family caregivers being active partners in defining agendas and making decisions. And at, at that level, the information flows bi-directionally through the um, process, throughout the process of engagement, and uh, decision-making responsibility is shared. And so um, I think we're, what we'd like to do is strive towards that higher end of engagement, although we certainly recognize the utility um, in certain engagement activities like um, focus groups for certain things. Um, we just don't want to um, rely on them solely. Next slide, please. I want to talk about one example, the um, primary, comprehensive primary care initiative, which is uh, getting ready to start its fourth year. And it's a, a program from the uh, CMS Innovation Center. And it's uh, multi-payer, public and private payers, uh, across seven markets, including uh, nearly 500 primary care practices. And here I've uh, mapped the uh, components of what patients and family caregivers say they want to what the Conference of Primary Care Initiative goals are. And you'll see that there is um, a pretty good one-to-one -one relationship between those two things. Next slide, please. So one of the milestones, and, and there are several that um, participants in the primary uh, Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative need to meet are focus on patient and family engagement. And there were a variety of options, um, two mainly, that uh, practices had to choose from. And that was either um, conduct patient experience surveys and then do a deeper dive into uh, some of the patient experience domains where they were um, performing not as well as they would like, or convening a patient family advisory council on a quarterly basis to understand what was working well, what wasn't working well, and to work together to come up with solutions. Um, some practices have elected to do uh, both of these things. <clears throat> and I want to say that while it's not the perfect milestone, it's certainly a huge leap um, um, when it comes to requirements around patient and family engagement where um, patients and families as advisors are integrated into the care process redesign uh, level. And so one of the practice groups that we've worked with, and we provide technical assistance um, to the primary care practices participating in this initiative around how to meaningfully engage patients and families in their practice transformation efforts, is that um, one of these groups that had 10 practices participating in CPC um, said that they felt um, that all the, all the um, patient advisors would help get them a deeper understanding of what was and wasn't working in their 
in their practice, whereas a patient experience survey, the results from that would just provide a signpost as to what might be working well or not working well, which is certainly great information to have, especially when you're benchmarking it against other practices in your region or nationally. Um, but it really wasn't giving them the granular level of detail that um, they could really benefit from when it came to um, the details regarding what works or doesn't, doesn't, as well as some ideas around what could work better. And so these uh, 10 practices each started their own patient family advisory council and we helped them to do so. So let's go to the next slide. This is just a, a high level um, summary of um, what most of the patient family advisory councils that participated in conference of primary care initiative practices were focusing on. So in year one, um, the most common area of focus um, was communication. It was chosen by almost 60% of practices. And uh, the least common area, self-management support and shared decision making, was chosen by only 16%. In year two, common themes um, were really around um, extending um, access um, or developing visit slots for walk-ins. Um, and improving communication and engagement with patients. So overall, I'd say that um, what we've seen with these practices is they typically go after low-hanging fruit um, at the beginning, so uh, changes that might be easier to make. Um, and this is perfectly fine because they are good for establishing a trusting relationship um, between patient advisors and clinicians and staff that may not have worked in this way before together, um, and, and then provide a strong foundation for the groups to address harder or more complicated issues down the line. So I want to talk about one of the practices, this practice group in um, upstate New York, and um, the way that they work with their patient family advisory council. Um, one thing that we heard from the staff is that uh, working with advisors really helped them confront assumptions about what their patients wanted, needed, and what they wanted to know. Um, so for instance, do they even know about um, extended office hours? Um, do they know um, that shared decision-making tools are available? Um, how do we engage in these conversations with people? So I wanted to say that um, these, this group worked on um, improving advanced care planning, and they improved um, access to their, uh, to their practices. And in just six months' time, they nearly doubled the number of advanced care uh, records on file. And um, they've already seen a downward trend in hospital admissions um, for ambulatory sensitive conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a short list of examples for how to partner with patients and families. We map these examples to the Conference of Primary Care Initiative milestones, but there are many more ways to partner with patients and families. Um, one example with uh, accountable care organizations is to um, work with patients and family advisors on how you reinvest the shared savings. So I know the Camden ACO is doing just this. Um, let me turn to the next slide because I'm running out of time. This is just a high level of um, best practices around partnering with patients and families. Um, I don't have time to go into them today, but you'll see on the last slide my contact information. Uh, we've worked with um, countless practices, ACOs, hospitals on developing effective partnerships with patients and families. Um, and I'm happy to share more about those details and how you might be able to do so um, in any of your advanced primary care, excuse me, advanced uh, payment model initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, now I'm pleased to introduce Mike Kolosha, who directs the Oncology Solutions Division at Aetna. He will share what Aetna has learned about engaging patients from cancer care delivery reform. Thanks, Mike. Alan, thank you uh, very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk about um, payment reform from the commercial payer perspective. Um, I am fairly certain that some of the things that I'm going to say will be, per, will be um, a little bit controversial, but um, I want uh, everybody on the call to uh, keep two, um, kind of two concepts front of mind. 
The first is the concept of collaboration, and the second is the concept of transition. Um, the book has yet to be written about what the right way to proceed is. Um, I'm going to speak about what we've learned from cancer delivery reform in Aetna. Now, the reason I'm going to talk about cancer delivery reform is because it's the only thing I know anything about. I'm an oncologist. I practiced oncology both in an academic and community setting for over 20 years. I joined Aetna three years ago. I brought with me some baggage. I have some prejudices about what um, I personally experienced um, uh, in caring for cancer patients. Uh, and I must tell everyone on the call that uh, I have had a, um, oh, let's call it an immersion in, uh, in health care um, uh, delivery. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how the health plan actually looks at uh, the issues of uh, payment reform in oncology. Now, why do we care about oncology? And I think there are two major reasons that the health plan cares about oncology. The first is that we spend a fair amount of money on cancer care. It's about 11% about of our total spend. And the population is aging, and as a consequence, we're seeing more cancer care. So um, expense, uh, of course, is an important consideration. I think the second very, very important consideration is um, we, we at the health plan uh, have a really hard time uh, understanding uh, what constitutes good care. I mean, um, in other words, we, uh, you can define value as uh, however you choose to define value, but, but the, the, way it's, uh, the way that cancer care has been paid for in a traditional fee-for-service model really does not reward quality. And so we are concerned about that. And part, a big part of the reason we're concerned about both of these is that if you look at a big company like Aetna, 23.5 million covered lives, um, about 60 to 70 percent of our business is um, employer-sponsored health care, uh, employer-subsidized health care. And uh, irrespective of what happens in the election or, or, or um, uh, Medicare or whatever, I think it's fair to say that uh, Employer-sponsored healthcare uh, remains uh, will remain an important piece of how healthcare is paid for in this country for the foreseeable future, and and the employers really care. So I think if you look at cancer specifically, um, managed care companies do what managed care companies do, right? I mean, so this is what managed care companies do: they they negotiate contracts at a discount with providers. They they authorize expensive services. They manage their networks. They, they shift responsibility to the member. They have these kind of weak process measures. These strategies just don't work very well in, in cancer care. One might argue they just don't work very well in health care as it's delivered today, period. And, and so we, we've, we've made a lot of people mad at us. And so I have suggested. Uh, that we look at alternative approaches. Um, my, my team really, uh, every day we, we all sit together and we chant the following two lines. We want to get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, and we want to make sure that the patient has the best possible experience and the best possible outcome. And everything that we're looking at, uh, everything we're looking at is around these two issues. Now this is reality. So reality is that the cost of care for cancer is going up. Um, we spend more on can uh, cardiac care, but if you look at per affected member, we spend more on cancer than anything else. And what we spend on cancer really depends on whether you're getting chemotherapy or not getting chemotherapy. If you're getting chemotherapy, and let's say that's about a third of cancer patients, um, how the dollars are spent is really, really very different. I mean. Chemotherapy patients are the most expensive patients, and a, a, a substantial piece of, of their cost is around uh, m uh, uh, medical injectables and medical pharmacy. So as payers look at oncology reimbursement reform, they really believe strongly that, that there has to be a way to control cost and there has to be a way to improve quality. And there are two major models that are moving forward at the present time. One is around clinical pathways, 
and one is around the oncology medical home. And I'm briefly discuss with you uh, our experience with both of those today. So why are clinical pathways something that, that have gotten the uh, payer's attention? Well, that's summarized, I think, on this slide. Um, it is hard to be an oncologist and not be excited about the innovation that's happening. It's quite amazing. We know more now uh, than we ever have before about how to treat patients. But if you look solely at the drug piece, solely at, the, uh, uh, um, at both medical injectables, medical pharmacy, pharmacy benefit, there is a tremendous dis disconnect between the new agents and the, their cost uh, at the time of, uh, uh, of introdu introduction into the marketplace and, let's say, the regulatory endpoint. So this is work that was done, University of North Carolina, a nice article published within the last year, that basically showed that the correlation between the, the price at release and the, uh, and the regulatory endpoint, the correlation was poor, uh, which is to say that new drugs enter the mar marketplace at the price uh, at which uh, the market can bear the drug. So, so there's been this uh, attempt to uh, utilize um, models of, of, uh, of just somehow quantitating um, quantitating uh, what the value is of these new agents. And, and so clinical pathways is one way of doing it. Um, so uh, there are a number of commercial clinical pathways companies. Some uh, payers have done this in-house. Aetna has not. And they all pretty much operate on the same uh, platform. They look at the, uh, what would be considered a covered benefit. And remember, that's largely regulated. That does not vary from a health plan to health plan. Um, that's regulated at the, uh, 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 at the insurance commissioner level. So what's covered? Um, what the evidence is from the primary liter literature regarding efficacy, what the side effect profile is from that literature, and then cost is considered. Now, some people don't like the idea that, that cost is considered. So why should cost be considered? And there's two really important reasons that cost ought to be considered. The first is that... Um, Somebody's got to pay for it. So if you have commercial health insurance, most of the time when you're getting injectable chemotherapy, you have a, uh, uh, a copayment. You don't have a coinsurance. And most of the time, if you have a pharmacy benefit through your health insurance, you do have a coinsurance. Now, if you have a coinsurance, you're feeling that in your pocketbook. And if you have a copayment, everybody who's paying premiums is feeling it in their pocketbook. But let's take a more clear-cut case. Let's talk about Medicare. Run-of-the-mill Medicare patients have a coinsurance across the board. So in fact, if you get a medical injectable as part of your chemotherapy, you will be billed 20%. Now there is ample evidence that the cost, uh, that the cost of chemotherapy contributes to toxicity in a very real way. So should cost be considered? Well, there's a formal way to consider it. Now, there are two really, really, really important things that are not considered in this. And, and the first is patient reported outcomes or patient weighing of side effect profile. And the second is real world evidence. So remember what I said. It's transitional and it's collaborative. So it can be better. I'll also suggest to you that we should not view the current clinical pathways programs as being uh, the final state. I would suggest to you that <clears throat> um, we don't actually really want N of one. We want N of the right size population that helps me understand what's most likely to benefit me, um, what's most likely to affect me in terms of toxicity and efficacy. I think ultimately rapid learning systems like CancerLink may serve this this function, but until we get to that rapid learning system universe, there has to be a way to help patients, to help doctors, and to help, to make the help, to help the health plan uh, all work in collaboration to find the right uh, approach for the patient. Let me talk a little bit about the oncology medical home. Uh, I really appreciated Lauren's comments. Uh, I had no such uh, preconceived notion about what a medical home was, but I just thought, you know, when, when I was taking care of patients, I, 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 uh, I had certain expectations of the care they should receive, and I think they had certain expectations. We talked about that. And there's a lot of 
concepts within the patient-centered medical home that are easy to embrace. Team-based care, evidence-based care, good access, care coordination, quality, all of that is good stuff. And when, when my relationships with my patients mirrored that, I felt that we were succeeding. So Oncology Medical Home uh, is an outgrowth of the primary care patient center medical home uh, movement. Now, the Oncology Medical Home is, is not quite as, as well formulated. In fact, it's a work in progress. Um, we don't have accreditation uh, yet for the Oncology Medical Home, but it's coming. But we have a certain idea about what this ought to look like. Um, a couple things are really, really clear. The first is, we have to, as we look at the oncology medical home, we need to focus on quality reporting. So I have a relationship with a large practice in Texas, Texas Oncology, and we were fortunate enough to uh, be able to uh, utilize an oncology medical home delivery model for a very large population, Texas Teachers Retirement, uh, Medicare Advantage population. And we have had a very, very good relationship. Um, the group has uh, been uh, really um, focused on finding ways to help us understand the quality of care that they are delivering. So when I have meetings with this group, we do not discuss coverage policy or the contract. We talk about this. How are they performing in terms of patient satisfaction? Are they measuring pain? Uh, are they talking to the patient about advanced care planning? This is a different dialogue. And I, in turn, can provide them with the analytics, an analytic tool that we built internally that I think is key to process improvement. This has allowed us to do some really interesting things. So, for example, when you think about personalized care, I'm going to suggest to you that you just not think about what the DNA sequence is of that patient's cancer. What we have learned through this kind of model is that, for example, Medicare Advantage members uh, managed by this group uh, who have lung cancer, advanced lung cancer, are a particularly vulnerable population. We need to pay attention to how they interact with the healthcare team and they need a personalized approach. What does that mean? You need to talk to them. You need to find out what's going on with them because if you don't, they wind up in the hospital. And if they wind up in the hospital, they're there for a long time. And believe me, I never took care of a cancer patient who wanted to go to the hospital. Now, the exciting thing for me right now is that the MMI's oncology care model, if you really look at it, uh, is an oncology medical home model. Um, now, it's the government, right? So they got to tell you exactly what to do. I'm a little bit more flexible, but I'm pretty good with all the things they want you to do. They want you to use navigation services. They want you to use a care plan. They want you to use data. I, I am very excited about the oncology care model, and we should soon know which practices have been selected for this pilot, because I think it's going to be a powerful catalyst for change. It's going to start to uh, get providers to really, really think about their processes of care. And of course, it, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to engage patients uh, in terms of what represents good quality care. So I think you need to think about this as transition. I, you know, payers are really interested in shifting responsibility and shifting risk, but we are not ready for that in oncology, and I think we're not ready for that in a lot of uh, healthcare um, where uh, complex patients are being managed. But I think it's going to happen. We cannot get there unless we go through this transitional model where we start to uh, look at what really matters, what matters to the payer, but also very much what matters to patients and to providers. Ultimately, collaboration is the only way we're going to move this forward. So my conclusions are um, ongoing reimbursement reform really has the potential to profoundly improve the value of cancer care, but it's transitional. Uh, current models really are more patient-centric than previous models, and partnership uh, is key. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Alan. Thanks, Mike. That was excellent, and thank you to all of our 
panelists uh, this afternoon for wonderful presentations. Uh, now we'll switch to the questions. Um, so if you, I have a few as the moderator's prerogative, I'm happy to pose, um, but would love to see some from the audience. So please enter those in on your chat function. Uh, just one to start the conversation is, you know, going down the line, this is for all panelists, maybe you could point out this one very specific action you would like to ask webinar participants to take uh, from your presentations uh, related to your recommendations. So one action item that you would put forward to individuals on this call that they can take back to their organizations to consider. Maybe we'll start with, I'll put somebody on the spot, um, Sarah. Of course you pick uh, me. Panel. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yep. No, 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 no worries. Yeah, you know, I think one of the most important things that we've been we've been saying is, you know, is we keep talking about the need for patients to be engaged and engage, you know, join the LAN, provide feedback. Yeah, it's a lot of work and I think that we can do a better we could be doing a better job of helping patients better target where their input is needed. Um, but until we kind of get there, you know, it is going to be a little bit of work for patients to engage. And, and I think, you know, from, that's sort of from my perspective, it do things like joining the LAN, um, keeping apprised of what's coming out of the work group, um, and providing that direct input where um, where you feel like it's useful. Um, and do that with the LAN. Do that, you know, we're always happy to get input from from Pitsy's perspective. Provide that input over to the quarry. But wherever you see an opportunity, plug in. Thanks. Uh, how about you, Mike? Yeah, so I think um, uh, everybody on this call, irrespective of where they are in the ecosystem, uh, whether they recognize it or not, have prejudices about who's wearing a white hat and who's wearing a black hat. Lose the prejudices. I think um, getting to know the other members of the uh, ecosystem, giving them the benefit of the doubt, but ultimately holding them accountable is only, the only way we're going to move this forward. I, I, I love the idea that, um, that you know, if in the next month you could reach out to one, um, one physician group, one, um, uh, one patient group, one, one somebody, and see if you can find a way to move it forward, I think that would be wonderful. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Lauren? Sure. So building off of what Mike said um, in terms of losing the prejudices, I, I, I agree um, that we need to do that and would also say, though, that this is, uh, represents when we partner with patients and families in, in these new ways. Um, it is just that. It is new work. Um, and sometimes it can be threatening work. And so I would say that we do need to acknowledge some of the fears that um, all stakeholders have, whether they are providers, um, or uh, patients or patient representatives or, or even payers and start to talk about um, why we have those fears and how we can address them. And, and we do that a lot with uh, various organizations. The other thing I would say is um, a lot of organizations don't um, understand or a lot of people within each organization don't understand what efforts um, their own organization is already undertaking to partner with patients and families. So I think if you don't know what those are in your organization, um, a good first step is to seek out um, what you are already doing to partner with patients and families, whether it's in an alternative payment model or otherwise, and see what you have to build from. Because we usually there is some foundation that you can build from with these partnership efforts. Uh, thanks, Lauren. And uh, some questions here from the, the audience, so to speak. Uh, I believe this one is for you, Lauren, and it asks, is there, could you talk a little bit more about improved self-management not being part of meaningful patient engagement? So, Kristen, thanks for raising this, and, and I think sometimes um, I don't do the best job of representing that particular slide, and that is, um, of course, um, improved self-management self is uh, a part of meaningful patient engagement. But I think what has happened in the past and still in some organizations today is that um, it's, it's up to the um, patient to do all of this work where 
there may be a variety of other circumstances, whether they are system generated or otherwise, that may inhibit a patient's ability um, to be um, meaningfully engaged in their own self-management of their uh, health and health. So it's certainly a part. Um, I think what I was trying to say earlier was that it shouldn't be the sole strategy um, that uh, any organization takes to um, improving engagement. Thank you, Lauren. And a question here that seems like for maybe all the panelists, um, but maybe uh, Mike, you might be take a crack at this first, but others can certainly chime in. What have the results been on improving both quality and cost on the two oncology models to date? Okay, sure. So, um, so the the um, uh, the work is is relatively new. Um, uh, and and so let's let's first start with quality. The issue the issue with uh, uh, quality improvement is that benchmarking is very very difficult. Um, so we will have more insight on quality improvement over time, but with the absence of benchmark data, it's problematic. I can't speak to the economic impact. So on that project that I described in Texas, um, we have uh, we have enrolled about 500 cancer patients over about two years, uh, and have um, uh, in the first year of the program saw about half a million dollars in savings, and in the second year, uh, almost a million and a half. Which is to say that we probably have, um, and and the way those uh, those programs measure impact is um, comparison of patients in the program uh, with those who are uh, Ma Medicare Advantage patients in, in Texas who are, uh, who are not part of the program. So it's not, we have chosen not to look at um, improvement within the practice over time. And the reason we chose not to do that is because I think, you know, this is a common debate among people who do this work is, if you've got a really high-performing practice, you, there, there probably is uh, a point at which further improvement becomes very, very difficult. So we've decided we would look at a concurrent, uh, a concurrent matched uh, control group. So um, we're, we're really pleased with that. Um, we're into the third year of the program. Some of the other programs that I have, we were actually just, just about to start looking at um, uh, at the impact uh, of, of one year of the program. I, I think it's important to remember there's a learning curve here. And so uh, I think what we learned in Texas was the savings that are generated in year one are different than the savings that are generated in year two. And one builds upon the other. So as you think about how these kind of programs are, and, and I'm pretty sure CMMI is going to see this as well. Uh, it, there, there is a culture change piece, and when I say culture change, I mean not just the doctors. So my phone triage system when I was in practice drove me bananas. I tried to standardize it. I tried to get you know, people to understand that same-day visits were a really good thing in oncology. I, I just had a really hard time doing it. And as a consequence, the patients didn't call. You get, the patient's got to believe that if you call, if they call, you're going to pick up the phone. So, I, you know, so we need to change expectations. We need to deliver on promises. We've got, we got to get the providers to change too, and then we've got to reward them for it. So there's a, there's a stepwise progression through these delivery reform models. And thanks, Mike. And maybe could you elaborate just a little bit more on the quality and the challenges of measuring that, and maybe other, uh, Lauren and Sarah could chime in on that as well. Yeah, big, a big challenge with the quality piece is the data has to be routinely collected and ideally routinely collected as part of the process of care. So some stuff is pretty sim simple, right? I can get it from claims, but some stuff is really hard. Like um, I love, well, love is a strong word. I think the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale is a, a wonderful way to follow how patients are doing uh, as they go through their, their cancer journey. Um, uh, I happen to know that the group we're working with in Texas has actually hardwired that into their electronic medical record. But of course, they didn't used to have it in their electronic medical record. So I know they're asking the patient about pain. I know they're asking the patient about fatigue. 
Um, I would love to come to a universe where the patient actually pushes that data to the to the doctor um, and and um, and and can do it basically real time. We're not there yet. So benchmarking is a challenge because I, I don't know how well they did with pain last year. I just know what they did this year. Thanks, Mike. And Sarah and Lauren, any comments from you about the quality and measurement of it, in particularly in the the cannibal care setting or the patient-centered medical home or population-based or bundled payment um, systems? I'm happy to provide a broad-based comment, and I'm sure Lauren can give something more specific. But I think you know, just one of the things that I think has concerned Pipsy in the past is just that patients are not always engaged in the development of that quality measure. And I think, you know, we often hear that there's a huge burden on providers because there's a million quality measures out there. And, and there's a lot of work to try to develop four measure sets, you know, things that we're measuring in terms of quality across the board. And it's very important to do that. You know, but it's also very important to make sure that the measures that we're using in practice are the measures that most truly reflect what patients care about and what patients want to achieve from their care. Um, and so there's a patient engagement component that just like, you know, we, we, we talk about patients being engaged in this, in this world of alternative payment models, I think it's going to be equally important for patients to be engaged in the development and use of the quality measures that we're using to determine whether an APM has been successful. And uh, this is Lauren, and I'll respond um, to both Mike and Sarah and, and say that the National Partnership is actually working um, with some of the uh, measure developers that have contracts from CMS um, to do uh, just what Sarah said, which is um, get patients and family caregivers more involved in the measure development process. Um, as you can imagine, um, that is certainly uh, new work, um, although for uh, quite a while patients have been engaged in technical expert panels, but they um, uh, we're working with the group to um, ensure that they have ongoing support um, to, to get them through those um, projects um, with the information that they need um, to, to bring uh, patient perspectives to the table. So um, if that is something that uh, you are engaged in as a measure developer or otherwise, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to put you in touch with the team at the National Partnership that's, that's doing that if you have any questions. All right. Well, thank you for the, that discussion on quality and cost. I uh, have a few questions here in the queue. We have about three minutes left, so I'm going to uh, sort of jump around here and try to get to all these, but I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, we will certainly follow up with any questions that we weren't able to answer to make sure we get them answered offline. Um, here's one that uh, from Becky asks, um, how should specialty medical organizations support and include patients in the development of alternative payment models? Um, how do non-patient, how do non-patient facing specialties make the shift without taking on unfairly attributed risk under value-based payment models? That's a great question, Becky. Anybody want to tackle that one for that panel? Gosh, I wish Andrew Sterling was on the phone. He's the representative on that population-based payment work group for the land that is looking at some of these attribution issues and. It's a very technical and very complicated issue, um, you know. But I do think it's a fair question, and I know it's something that that work group is is, is grappling with, um, and it's certainly an area where, you know, again, and with, with these complex and technical questions, um, you know, it's going to be very important for us to help patients plug in and, and to help navigate it. Um, I don't have the answer to that question. I think Mike is probably best to answer it, but I think it's a great example of how technical questions can be. And we need, to have, we need to be providing that kind of support that Lauren described for patients to be engaged um, and to help work through them. Boy, I, I, I tell you, I, uh, if I had the answer, I'd share it with you. Um, I don't. Um, I got my hands full with what I got. But uh, it, is a, it is a very, very important question. Um, uh, as, uh, as Sarah referenced, perhaps the working group that's tackling this right now may have some insights into that, and we'll certainly feed this question into them, and maybe it can be addressed in the, the draft paper they're working on. Um, sorry, Becky, weren't able to get you a, a, the right answer, but I don't know that anyone has the right answer to that question, but it's a good one. Um, so moving up here, um, any examples of mobile devices being used effectively right now for patient feedback? And, what does the future of that look like?
So this is my, uh, and I'll just say that uh, uh, I am frequently approached um, by um, startups that have a technology that they would like to marry um, to the uh, oncology medical home type delivery model. Um, all of them have, um, uh, you know, have certain attributes that are very attractive. Um, but they're pretty early. Uh, I think uh, there are challenges with uh, interface with the with the physicians. Um, how do you get the information to the doctor in an actionable um, format? Um, I do expect um, that this may become the uh, the best possible uh, way uh, to collect patient reported outcomes. Maybe initially in cancer clinical research and then ultimately in cancer practice. I, I have no doubt that this is going to be a critical way in which um, lines of communication are open between patients and doctors. And this is Sarah. I think PCORI actually, I, PCORI has a whole portfolio of projects where they're comparing the effectiveness of shared decision-making tools and patient decision aids. Um, I don't know that portfolio, you know, by heart, but it might be a good place to look at for some information, at least on what what they're comparing. Um, you know, I think the goal is obviously to make sure that um, as we as we look at these tools that <clears throat> that we're you know ad, that we're promoting the ones that that demonstrate the most effectiveness in practice. Um, but I think you know a challenge to this though is too that, and again this comes back to something I said earlier that you know I think. Part of this process, as we think about what it means to be patient-centered, is going to be, you know, we also need to put some meat behind what it means to do care planning, what it means to do shared decision-making. And I think these, these kinds of patient decision aids that get created, we need to make sure that they are meeting those criteria, right, providing the right kind of information to patients in the right language, you know, um, from a literacy standpoint, et cetera. Um, and there's just a lot that we still have to learn. Um, but it sounds like, I mean, I, you know, I think what's, what's wonderful is that that work is starting to get done. We're, we're at least starting to talk about these things to make sure that we're, as all these tools, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of new tools being developed. Um, but we want to make sure that, that, that they're meeting some sort of criteria. Well, I, we're almost out of time, so I, want to, I know we have a few closing comments from Mark. So I want to thank the panelists for their presentations and their insightful answers to the questions. I want to thank the audience members for their wonderful questions. Um, sorry we couldn't answer all of them, uh, but like I promised, and I know there's already been some follow-up on the chat, uh, we'll get to those questions offline and we'll make some connections for you. We'll post the answers on the LAM website for all of you, so if you saw some questions that came through that you were like, hey, that didn't get answered, um, they'll be posted to the LAM website um, later on. Um, so thanks again to everyone, and I'm going to turn it back over to Mark to offer some closing comments. Thanks, Alan, and uh, thanks again to our panelists and to all of you who asked questions. Um, as I mentioned previously, the uh, population-based work group, the payment work group, will be shortly releasing its draft white papers for comments. I want to bring this to your attention because it's an opportunity for you to provide input on these drafts. So please plan to join us on February 9th for a presentation on the patient attribution and financial benchmarking um, drafts that come from those two sprints that the PBP has been working on. We'll also be conducting listening sessions for various stakeholder groups during the month of February on this topic, so stay tuned for those invitations. Also on February 24th, our next uh, LAN Learnings webinar will be conducted in partnership with the Healthcare Transformation Task Force, which has been doing work for some time on payment models for patients with chronic illness, a subject that came up several times today. So please tend, uh, plan to attend this presentation on February 24th. Um, there's obviously a lot going on, and we look forward to your participation in these important next steps in the LAN's work. Um, so finally, um, just to remind you that uh, we do this every month. We appreciate your attendance and hope that uh, you'll be with us again next month. We're pleased that so many of you could join us and uh, appreciate your support and involvement as always. Have a good afternoon and thanks.